What is happening there, citizens of the Reject Nation? We are here today to do our use, our Monday use which is to watch from our friend Paul the heavy spoilers The Last of Us episode 3 Easter eggs and breakdown reaction I think I sound just like I, him I almost thought you were him for. I was about to People say Paul yeah, but don't make an ass out of you or me Greg okay theory time theory time theory time <laughs> alright guys we'll leave a like if you haven't seen our episode 3 reaction it's up here on the Chanel right now John and Terrors will be up manana that means tomorrow in Spanish right that means tomorrow and Pedro Pass Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to it. Now, the first thing I want to do is go through Bill's story in the PlayStation Classic for anyone who hasn't played it. This will kind of give you an idea of just how much things were changed and what we originally had first time round. As always, we will be saving future spoilers for the end of the video, and if you enjoy it, then please hit the thumbs up button, and don't forget to I've subscribe already done it. break down I've done it all. Done By it. the way, huge thank you for clicking this. You're welcome. Now let's get into the Is that you voicing over in this video? <laughs> now in the game, you arrive in Lincoln, having just escaped the state building. This culminated in Tessa's death, and Joel and Ellie fled into the subway after being chased by Fedra. You never really got to catch your breath, and on the Sports. other side of this, when you slowed down, Joel refused to talk about Tess. This showed just how cold he was, and even upon reaching Bill, he just played along that she was alive without ever correcting him. Mm -hmm. Now, the way that Joel and Ellie met with him was that they sprung one of his traps, which led to Joel being suspended upside down in one of the tensest scenes in the game. Great level. Swarmed by infected, yeah. you had to defend yourself and Ellie as they tried to tear you apart. This is when Bill came in, and after making your way to his church, you laid low for a bit before mounting a plan to get a truck battery. This was from a military caravan that had crashed into a nearby school, in an area that Bill normally refused to go to. This was due to that side of town being teeming with infected, but because he owed Joel a favour, they decided to head out there. Overloaded with infected, you found that the battery had already been taken, and you had to push through the school before making it to a neighborhood. That's when you After fought them. across a house, oh. you learned who'd there taken the a battery, special creature and this in that Bill's level. ex-Frank, who had made a break for it. Unlike the show, Frank couldn't stand Bill anymore, and when the caravan crashed, he devised a plan to take the battery. On the way out, though, he'd been bitten, and he ended up unaliving himself before the infection took its toll. You see, there was something really interesting about the way it's played out here where you're talking about the tv show right no the game uh, andrew okay, the sorry. game listen to what i'm saying sorry 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 what i'm saying andrew it's pretty much alluded that bill and frank perhaps are in a relationship why i say alluded is because it it's the way it kind of transgresses in the actual game is it seemed like it was sort of a secret between bill and frank it's not something where it seemed like their relationship was super open about it you could have just you know, translated as, no, they were just friends, but they were maybe secretly gay. It mm. didn't seem like they were an openly gay couple. I always interpreted it as they were gay just when he said he was my partner. I know you could take that in, in other ways, but that's just how I took it and the way he, how, you know, the, the sorrow. It's true. It's yeah. just my homophobia like, got Greg, in the way. Greg, listen to me. <laughs> listen to the game, Greg. Listen to what the game I'm is so saying. sorry. No, no. When I he's, grew up yeah. Catholic. I hear partner. I feel, oh, business. Yeah, exactly. They I mean, business if it wasn't a post-apocalyptic <laughs> world, I might have probably bought into that. But yeah, also, too, you could see kind of the sorrow, you know, and how sad Bill was at when he first saw him. And then also when he got that note, like, he looked deeply hurt True. by it so that's that's why i took it that way he left a note behind for bill saying how much he hated him and after finding his truck you popped the clutch and headed out to pittsburgh great level now that's the way the game played it with it being heavily focused on action and a massive deviation from what we get here <laughs> I'll be going through how stuff compares to the game as we get into it, but that's kind of a bird's eye view of how it plays out so you can instantly see how different it is to the show. Now we begin with Joel dipping his hand into a river and there's a tension drawn of the cuts on his knuckles from smashing that god's face and like it's the like button. Ellie very much represents the daughter that he couldn't save and the lesson that he learned from this is the wrong one and he might end up thinking that violence is the way to achieve things. I suppose it probably is the right lesson in this world, but he clearly wrestles with losing his cool like this. Now this idea of losing one's control is juxtaposed by the stone stacking that we see him carrying out. Typically, you'd see something like this in a spa, and stone stacking is carried out because it has a spiritual connection to the earth. It also takes time and effort to create the balance in the pile, and thus stone stacking is seen as being something that showcases one's patience. However, it goes beyond that, and it's a practice that's been carried out in several cultures dating all the way back to ancient Mongolia. 
Stone stacks were also used for navigation wow. in rural areas due to there not being signposts or roads out in the woods or by rivers. I think it's more for the former reason, but I, I just thought I'd bring that up too. But you know, it's also ironic. Joel is from Texas. And in Texas, stacking rocks in Texas state parks actually isn't allowed. Mm. So perhaps it goes in conjunction with him being rebellious. I don't know. Texas and stacking rocks isn't allowed. So you know what? It goes. It stays in the real rejects reaction to heavy spoilers video as some type of contribution to this fact about stacking rocks. Now they're 10 miles outside of Boston in the woods, which is a location that you start off at before traveling into Lincoln. Ellie's now wearing a green coat with a red hoodie, and this is something that she done later on in the game once we hit the winter sections. Though Joel's pretty shut off from her, I like the touch that they've added here, which is that she's using his jacket for a blanket. At this point, he's still reeling from the death of Tess, but due to being a closed book, he refuses to open up. He still clearly cares though, and he tosses her some food, which leads into a conversation that plays out slightly differently in the game. They kind of change up the positioning of the lines, and Joel says not to bring up Tess here, whereas he does it at the end of the episode in the show. Hey, look, um, about Tess. Uh, listen, about Tess. I, I don't even know what Here's how this thing's gonna play out. You don't bring up Tess. Ever. Rule one, you don't bring up Tess. Ever. In fact, we just keep our uh, I love to these ourselves. side by sides. So yeah. Much. We just keep our histories to ourselves. <laughs> Secondly, don't tell anybody about your condition. Rule two, you don't tell anyone about your condition. They think you're crazy, they'll try to kill you. They see that bite mark, they won't think it through, they'll just shoot you. And lastly, you do what I say when I say it. Rule three, you do what I say when I say it. We clear? We clear? Yes. Repeat it. Sure. Repeat it. What you say goes. What you say goes. Good. Okay. You see, what I loved about seeing this side by side comparison is whatever actors are doing a scene, there's one of the common terminologies is what is the actor's prior moment going into it? What happened before this scene that we are doing? Because that often can be a dictation of how you're going to be going about your performance in that current scene, right? Mm -hmm. Even though the, the lines are pretty much the exact same way, the placement of it gives it a completely different prior moment and leading into it. So the delivery from the actors is going to be very different type of energy and tone and mood. While a little bit similar in some variations of the levels, of course, it also feels like a, a, a very different kind of scene because of how we got to this scene in the show versus the exact moments leading up to it in the game itself. So I think having a cool side by side by like that makes it feel like, oh, we're getting like two very different scenes by that point. No, you know what a, I mean? Yeah, that's a very good observation because as you were just saying in the video game, we get to the that moment right after what happens to Tess, whereas in the show, we get to that moment after a lot of traveling after, and shit. Yeah, yeah, a lot of traveling. <laughs> so they're a little more calm and they're, yeah. you know, it's not just, uh, they had not just been through an emotional ordeal. So it's really cool seeing those side by side. And again, what I love about these actors is they're not imitating they're making it their own as well but yeah. that's a great observation you made thank you that's why i'm here and also to point out that in texas stacking rocks is illegal, illegal in the parks i'll remember <laughs> that if i ever go there do not stack rock that's the only the crime i'm not going to commit is stacking rocks either way joel is completely shut off and they hike for four hours before passing through the woodlands one of the things that's never really touched upon about The Last of Us is how much it focuses on the beauty of nature and how once humanity has been whittled down, the earth can reclaim the land. Beautiful Getting apocalypse. Here, but uh, cordyceps themselves could very much be seen as a defense mechanism for earth and tying back to the climate change comments, this could be the planet finding a way to get rid of us without creating Skynet. Big theory <laughs> time for that, but Ellie asks Joel how he got his scar and he says it's from the early days when someone shot at him and missed. Though he says that he shot back, it is possible that this could have come from the night Sarah died and it thinking. may have been a stray from the soldier's bullets. The scars up beside his temple and I think this would explain a lot if he was reminded of that night every time he looked in the mirror. Now they travel to Cumberland Falls, I, I thought which that was apparently the same thing. is a real store in America, so I learned something about our cousins every day. This is a stash house where Joel left behind supplies, but the real talking point here is the Mortal Kombat 2 cabinet. Ellie mentions her friend who knew everything about this game, and this is likely Riley, who was yep. touched upon in episode one. 
I can't tell you how much money oh, this machine swallowed at seriously? Amble Caravan Park when I was a kid. And me and my cousin Mark used to spend most of our time on a Saturday getting our asses kicked by Scorpion. Yep. Ellie brings up Mylena <laughs> and how she used to rip off her mask to reveal her horrendous teeth, which is one of the most memorable fatalities from Fatality. the game. Now, this scene actually pulls from yeah, the game itself. Angel knives. Instead of Mortal Kombat 2, we have a cabinet for the in-universe fighter called the Turning. And that is the character Angel Knives, and Ellie describes her fatality much in the same way that she does for Mylena here. Would well, you play this before? You ever play this one? I had a friend who knew everything about this game. No. But I had a friend that knew everything about this game. There's this one character named Melina who takes off her mask and she has monster teeth and then she swallows you whole and barfs out your bones. Uh. Apparently, there's this character called Angel Knives who'd... Uh, what was it? She'd punch a hole through your stomach before kicking your head off. <laughs> uh, I'm never a big fan of these things. Obviously, Warner Brothers own the rights to Mortal Kombat, and with them owning HBO as well, they probably gave them that sweet, sweet corporate synergy deal, so we're not reduced to talking about this. Although the original Last of Us game didn't contain a poster for the game, the remake did, and they obviously released that. Like, you're not talking about Street Fighter. In the show. I will discuss uh, more in our super spoiler section how this arcade cabinet could pop up again, so make sure you stay locked until the end if you've completed the games. Way to keep me retained. Joel hasn't been out this way in a couple of years, and later on we discover that he only went out there once. In the game, Joel had never actually been out of Bill's town personally, so him going out there was a bit of a desperate move. Ellie heads out into the back room, and you eagle-eyed viewers might spot a safe code up beside the door. This what? reads 109250, which I googled to see if it was a code used in the game. Unfortunately, nah. it's not. And oh. I think this is just an Easter egg to the codes you'd find dotted about the game that would yeah. lead to upgrades and extra ammo. In the back, Ellie discovers her own secret, with there being a door that leads to the basement. <laughs> now, in there, she finds some things that you'd normally run into the game, like lockers and filing cabinets, with them usually having items lying in them. Here, we find someone trapped under the rubble, with a fungus growing out of the top part of their head. This is completely grown out of one of their eyes, and as the clickers showed, the cordyceps attach to the brain and then grow up from there. The brain of course controls the body, so doing this allows them to alter our behaviours and desires. True. Once it grew out, it ended up eating the eyes, and those further along in the infection chain ended up blind like the clickers are. Now in our first video, we discussed how the creative team wanted the infected to seem almost sympathetic, and there were times when you'd find them in a the corner sobbing away to themselves. When you think about it, having a parasite bury its way into your brain is a horrifying thing to experience, and this idea of them being tortured souls is definitely apparent here. I don't think we can show because of demonetization, but Ellie cuts him open, and we see how his flesh has very much become the plant. You know, I think that scene actually executed that well, because we haven't come across anything like that in the show yet, where there's an infected and they're like crying in the corner and stuff, which is a, a really common thing to encounter in the video game itself. But with this stalker uh, trapped under the rubble, there was something about that. Like when I was looking up at her where I was like, is Ellie feeling sorry for this guy? Because I'm feeling a little bit sorry for this guy right now, even though I know, you know, if he's not under the rubble, he's just going to attack her. Of course. But I did feel that sympathy that apparently the game developers did want you to somewhat feel for them. Yeah, because whenever you're playing the game, at least from my point of view, I, I never felt sympathy whenever I killed them. Yeah, you feel bad for the human that was once in there, of course, but they're Do no you? longer... They're, I don't. They're no longer that human anymore, but yeah, no, giving a sympathetic moment to, I believe that was a stalker, that was uh, that was an interesting position to uh, not only put you know the viewer there in that moment, but also just giving Ellie her first kill because she'd never experienced that as well. He then takes mercy on him by ending his suffering, and Joel stashes his assault rifle. Like I said last week, I've always thought of him more as a pistol and shotgun guy, and with there not being much ammo out in the wild for it, it's completely pointless carrying it. However, him stashing it here is important, and it also ties into why he doesn't take any of Bill's guns. Joel believes he's returning here, and he still sees Ellie as a job rather than being a person. This letter Solid at the end point. could have some effect on him, and it may end up changing the way he looks at the world. Now they come across a downed plane, which Ellie of course hasn't seen before. She's lived her entire life in the QZ, and there wasn't exactly Turkish Airlines promising flights Batman to Gotham in Metropolis. <laughs> this reminded me a lot of the scene from Steven Spielberg's War, War of the, the Worlds, Worlds when the characters came this across best something movie. similar. Ellie is fascinated by people getting to go up in the sky, but Joel points out the tragedy in it, and his life was of course massively changed by one. The opening of episode 1 had the scientists talking about how disease could travel faster now due to airplanes, and one crashed down taking out Joel, Tommy, and also Sarah's ride. 
I dreamt about flying the other night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Go on, tell me about it. So, I'm on this big plane full of people, and everyone is screaming and yelling because the plane's going down. So I walk to the cockpit, open the door, but there's no pilot. I try to use the controls, but I obviously have no clue how to fly a plane. And right before we crash, I wake up. I've never been on a plane. Isn't that weird? Overrated. Well, you know, dreams are weird. Now, the meaning of this <laughs> is difficult to discern, God, but I Joel, do I think you. that it gives insight to her character. Ali thought she was a passenger on a plane and that someone was in control and also guiding her. This could be represented by Fedra, who raised her, Marlene, who was actually looking after her, and then Joel, who of course took care of her. Now, these figures in her life could be representative of the pilots, but I personally think that they represent the passengers. The plane goes crashing down, and this is mirroring the fall of the world around her. She gets up to see there's no pilot, and then this shows huh. that no one is actually in control, and those of the passengers are unable to fly huh. the plane because no one really knows what they're doing. I think growing up, uh, all kids, yeah, they think adults have got their shit together, and then when they become one, they realize that no one actually knows what's going on, which, which I think this conversation could be signaling. Grim. Ellie asks about how the entire world is stabilized, and she talks about people sitting in restaurants fine and dandy, and then the first bite happening. This was something that we sort of seen play out last week, with Abu Ratna being picked up by the government in a restaurant before she was taken to examine a bite victim. Oh. Ellie bets it was actually monkeys who spread the disease, and this might be a nod to 28 days later. Don't they mention that in the game? Yeah, not going into spoiler territory, but there is a reference in the video game in regards to monkeys, which I won't elaborate further in, but if we do reach that point in the show, I'll go more into detail about that. The monkey reference is a little more specific. It's the Wizard of, it's the Wizard of Oz. Specific. It's the Flying Monkeys. Than just a 28 days later reference. Never seen it. Come on, Paul. I hope you mention in your spoiler section. If you don't, we got Andrew here to take you down. Now, what I also think they could be setting up here is something coming down the line. Although we will save it for, you know what, by now, for the super spoiler section. That must be it. <laughs> Joel talks about the best theory for how they managed to spread so easily. And this is something that was also touched upon last week. He correctly guesses that the cordyceps mutated and they somehow got into the food supply. Last week we heard how they changed at a flour and grain factory, which we discovered acted as the perfect substrate. This in technical terms is something that has specific enzymes that plants can live on, and here a change before spreading out further. If it got into the processing units in the factory, then it could spread into bread and cereal, which would then be eaten by people across the planet. I really hope this notion carries on throughout the season, and I'd love it if we went to a store and saw the shelves picked bare except for the cereal and bread aisle. Thank god it didn't infect the toilet paper, cause we all know how people love to grab that. Now Jill remembers yeah. the specific date it happened, which was on a Friday, September 26th. This is because it was of course his birthday, but beyond that it's also the day Sarah died. Now further up the path, they come across several skeletons. The game would have the odd scene like this, with red and blue clothing standing out amongst the corpses. We never really know what happened at these places in the game, but Joel fills us in on them. Now, much like what uh, happened with true. Him and Sarah, point. these were gunned down by soldiers, but the difference here is that they promised safety at a QZ. If there wasn't room, they'd take people into the countryside and fire upon them, and I think this scene could be taking inspiration from the ending of The Great Escape. This is also something that was carried out in the Holocaust, and later on, Bill even describes the government as being Nazis. Nazis. And yeah, the government true. are all Nazis. The government are all Nazis! Well, yeah, now, but not then. Also, with a great escape, I swear if someone's kicking off in the comments about spoilers for that, I'm gonna go mental. It's been out 60 years, you fing f. I've never seen it. You did spoil it for me though, Paul. Now, Joel says that they were killed so that they couldn't pass on the infection. Sorry. But I have it's other okay. theories about why this was done. People rebelled against Fedra, and scorning a group like this could potentially lead to an uprising. For example, if they promised safety at the QZ and then said you couldn't come in, it's gonna annoy a lot of people and it could lead to some backlash. And we then take focus on a rainbow blanket and a child's body, which takes us into our major flashback for the episode. Oh. I love how the series has done this, and every episode so far has had a major part of the past filled in, with elements that weren't present in the game. Now we're seeing what happened to the survivors days after the outbreak, and this is all new stuff to show us exactly what it was like. X's are painted on doors, and in the game you'd often come across these houses warning oh, you not to enter. That's in the true, game that's you actually true. found a note yeah, to a secret stash hidden by hunters that was marked with an X, so if you're playing through the game right now, then make sure you look out for that one. 
Every single person is being given a mandatory evacuation notice, and we see this in front of a Civil War monument. Along with fighting against the infected, The Last of Us is also about man versus man, and this brother versus brother monument could be heading towards that. This sign also popped up in the game, and when you entered Lincoln, you could spot it in the middle of the street. The irony is they'd actually be safer in the town as they end up being killed when they could have lived out the rest of their lives here. In the game, you could see how dangerous Lincoln was due to being overrun by infected, and here I was kind of thinking, I don't know why Joel and Tess didn't just stay here. Bill kind of shuts down the idea, but it's way better than the QZ, and I'm sure that, you know, a couple more bottles of wine, they could have convinced him it was a good idea. Anyway, at this point, we're introduced to Bill, played by Nick Offerman. We see him surveilling the town through CCTV, and he's very much an end of the worlder. Actually, used to work with a woman who, whose son thought Doomsday was coming, and he apparently spent years collecting tins of beans. Little did he know, Oof. it was toilet roll. Toilet ah. roll you needed to hoard, as they're bloody toilet taking, they're roll taking for it all. The beans. Get it quick! Now they really recaptured the look of Bill, and along with his trusted shotgun, he looks pretty identical to the game. He's got weapons lining the wall, and collections of guns and ammo magazine, along with a machete. This weapon's how he's introduced in the game, with him cutting off the head of an infected that's got Joel on the ground. He ends up donning his gas mask, which he also wore in that, and we see his bunkers cleverly located beneath a chest of drawers. Loved seeing the gas masks back, which is something he too wore on the PlayStation counterpart. As we know those spores have been removed from the series due to the creative team worrying that everyone would be asking why they aren't constantly donning gas masks. Again, I, I don't think people would have cared, but know, it could have also been for the budget or to see the actors' faces as they're terrified by the infected. Later on, we also see this room has a workbench in it. These pull directly from the game, and they're what players use to upgrade their weapons. Also, I forgot to mention last week that we actually had another nod to the game when Tess and Joel went into their backpack. They swung them off their shoulders and got on the ground, just like how Joel ah, does every yeah. time he wants to craft something. True. There's also the magazines that we see throughout the episode. In the game, these were used for upgrade Upgrades. trees, and they helped you yes. unlock special skills. I was thinking that. God, I love little Easter eggs like that. Yeah. Where the way it's even being played, like Joel getting on the ground and, and putting it down. They're so in the moment, it's so subtle, that they're not even registering. Like, oh, that's like how he does it in the game. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's been plenty of times, I feel like, throughout these three episodes where we've had moments like that where we're like, ah, the guitar ah, there's that but yeah there are other moments where you know we get someone amazing like paul to point out no it's there's the backpack moments like oh my goodness they, they were so subtle about it i didn't even realize but again yeah. you're just so in the moment i love the uh the upgrade like right when i saw I, that one i did notice but yeah I'm, I'm just again the attention to detail on this show and i'm glad they got neil Druckmann to work on this but it's great a eh? Now as Bill comes out of the ground, we can also see that he has a wine rack, and he raids a wine store later, showing how much it means to him when he serves a bottle to Frank. Frank is played by Murray Bartlett, and you might recognise him as playing Armand in The White Lotus. He's a complete opposite to Bill, and we can see this in many ways. Bill is kind of out of shape, and this is seen later on when the pair go jogging together. This actually speaks to their time in the apocalypse, as Bill's been kicking his feet up and living it up, whereas Frank has been fighting to survive. Out there, it's pretty much survival of the fittest. Meanwhile, Bill's in a safe place where it's $1.40-ish per gallon of, of <sighs> gas. Bring on the post apocalypse. Wow. Take, me the, take me back! Seriously. Now, we see that Bill's door has an X on it with markings around it. Like the one before, these are pulled from the game, but they've also appeared in real life, and during Hurricane Katrina, they could be found on doors. These to note how many are inside, which team searched it, and the date that they did. We can also see that Bill's house was built circa 1793, which makes it from pre-Civil War era. This further adds to his old school persona and how he doesn't trust the government. He's a regular old Ron Swanson who loves <laughs> guns and hates the New World Order. Anyway, the town is completely empty now, and we get a sort of last man on earth situation with him basically being able to do what he wants. It is funny because while he's not playing Ron Swanson, he is playing this certain way, like this could have been ron swanson in the apocalypse there's versions of have you seen parks and recreation i've never watched it the only clip i've ever seen from that show is the one uh, the kim kardashian joke that chris pratt made on the outtake everyone loves a good comeback story right kim kardashian in the video she gets she gets on her back i think have oh you ever yes. seen that yeah that's a very funny joke well let me try to contribute to the video then okay. while you do that whatever this is 
retake. Yeah, Ron Swanson. There's even an episode of Ron Swanson. It's like very anti-government. There's a whole episode where he's trying to go off the grid. But he is like free from the government and everything by the beginning of this one. This could have been Ron Swanson in here, but this is not the same kind of character. In so a lot you're of saying Neil Druckmann watched Parks and Rec and went, that's Bill. <laughs> yeah, in some ways. Montages like this are a staple of post-apocalyptic movies. And most famously, I remember the one from The Dawn of the Dead. It went on a shopping spree in the mall, but it's also something that popped up in 28 days later with them going into the supermarket and just going wild with all the food. Now this is to the backdrop of the song Yes I'm Coming Home by Fleetwood Mac. It makes it really upbeat and I think the entire point of Bill's story is to show that you can have fun and find love even in the apocalypse. Tess and Joel were a couple but they never really seemed like they were in love and instead I think the apocalypse pushed them together so they had safety in numbers. Joel has completely shut himself off, and to me the stuff with Bill and Frank could be a reflection of how he needs to open up. Now Bill takes a speedboat, fills up several barrels of petrol, and goes while at Home Depot. This is to build his traps, which we did end up encountering in the game when you first entered Lincoln. Normally you'd be walking along and would notice a tripwire, which you'd then have to set off either by luring in an infected or throwing a brick at it. He gave his traps and shotgun to Joel when he entered his home, and I love dropping these things throughout the game, you know, just a little trick for them. Now an infected sets up one later by pulling a trap by it, and Bill says, It doesn't get old. You're definitely right, yeah. and yeah, take me back to that game. And the first thing he does is secure the area, get some alcohol, and build a generator to power the town. He's created a nice little life for himself, and it's during this time that he ends up meeting Frank. Now Bill really was someone who was used to being alone, and people who prepare for the apocalypse tend to do so by themselves. It's rarely a group effort because it requires paranoia and shutting oneself off in order to survive. Frank shows that he should open up to people though, and if it wasn't for him, then he'd never know Tess and Joel. Four years later, we hear the song White Room by Cream, which has a lot of meaning that applies to the episode. The song is about someone stuck in a white room by themselves, and here they face depression and also loneliness. Bill, of course, has a white house, and this oh, is mirrored by most of the buildings. He's walled himself off from everything, and though he's alive, he's not really living for anything. This reminds me a lot of Alexandria from The Walking Dead, but there's no other people around, and therefore it's not really the restore of civilization. In the home he is a poster for Don't Tread On Me, and this also brings a lot of meaning with it. Not only was it a Metallica song, but it was also a political slogan used in the American Revolution. Oh. It dates all the way back to the Bible, and in Latin the phrase is Noli Mi Tangier. This means do not touch me, and it was said by Jesus to Mary Magdalene after his resurrection. The bond between physical and spiritual was at its highest during this point, and it came across more as a warning to her. I think it's more in line with a Metallica song, as it's the same as the cover that was used, and that song had lyrics like, give me liberty or give me death. The Riled Snake imagery yeah, was inspired by it. Benjamin Franklin, who said that the animal was a great symbol for the American spirit. Anyway, a trap is triggered, and out in the holy dog, Bill finds Frank. Believing it's its own trap, Bill is immediately suspicious, and in the game it was difficult to not immediately have paranoia when you came across someone new. I do really appreciate whenever you go out of your way to point out thematically what some of these more production design details ultimately entail because, you know, like, I love the idea of like diving further in and that adds further more to who this person is as a character and the world that they inhabited even before the apocalypse and what dictates them for where they're at now. So I think that's actually pretty cool to have some type of symbolism like that there that if you were to read into it, you'd find out, oh, this actually is a very specifically chosen thing because you're like, all right, yeah, but Bill likes classic. Classic rock makes sense, but there's a Metallica poster right there. And then you find out, oh, this is why this character would have this one there. So that's something that like people who develop games really think about. So to have that here in the show itself, I think is actually a really nice nugget that should not be overlooked. The don't tread on me. I mean, I agree with everything you just said, but the other point where he was mentioning, you know, the don't touch me kind of thing, I always felt that was more of in Bill's personality too, from what we remember in the video game, where like, remember how freaked out and crazy he would yeah. get on Ellie whenever she would touch to anything, invade any of his personal space or belongings. Kind of felt like it was kind of both ways on that. He says that he set out from Baltimore QZ, which we learn is no more. Now we never visit this location in the game, with the characters instead heading more in a northern direction to Pittsburgh. According to Google Maps, it's a six day walk non-stop between Baltimore Ooh. and Boston, so we can see why Frank's lost so many out on the road. Bill decides to take him in, and this all happens after using a scanner to get the all clear. Now they have dinner together, and Bill ends up feeding him rabbit. These were animals the characters had to hunt in the game, because 
obviously, yeah, the, the farm industry's gone. It's a complete opposite to what he's just gone through, and the man's been out on the road facing certain death, and now sipping wine and eating rabbit. He takes to the piano, and here he plays a song Long Long Time by Linda Ronstadt. This contains lyrics like, I can see I'm gonna love you for a long long time, which is something he sounds terrible to. You sound terrible, mate. You sound terrible, but it does play in the episode. Now Bill takes to it instead, and he manages to sing it perfectly. It kind of sums up the pair, I think, with one being chaotic, whereas the other is highly ordered and controlled. The lyrics, of course, sum up the relationship that they're about to be in, and for the next 45 minutes, we see the rest of their lives play out. Bill is different in the game, I think, because he's way more open, whereas in The Last of Us, he looks down on Joel for caring about people. And in this world, that sort of shit's good for one thing, getting you killed. So you know what I did? Well, why isn't the fuck up? And I realized it's gotta be just me. We never really see his relationship with Frank, and I have spoken to people who play the game without even picking up on it at all. Frank wasn't ever someone yeah, that we psych. actually met, but this episode and juxtaposition of that completely develops their relationship. Now he does of course share similarities with his game counterpart, like how he kicks off about resource management. Do I ask for things? Ever? He does that in the final edit too, and we find out that he's the one who reached out to Tess and Joel. They come over for a garden party, and Bill sees this as a bad idea, further dying into how closed off he is from humanity. He brings a gun to the dinner table, and Joel <laughs> says, We can't help each other and get that gun out of my face. <laughs> this of course goes beyond just being cautious, and the pair are of course both ready to flip at a moment's notice if the situation calls for it. They're left alone, and Joel offers to get more material to make the fence last the rest of their lives together. In the game, it was clear Tess was more of the point of contact, which is why Joel never visited Lincoln personally. Now, Tess and Frank talk about using the radio again, but they decide to use a code in case anyone's listening in. As we know from episode 1, this becomes the 60s, 70s and 80s music, which also plays into what they discover at the end. Now Jill warns that raiders will eventually swarm the town, and after Frank makes a strawberry garden, we see this playing out in the night. It reminded me a lot of I Am Legend, and keeping yeah. out raiders is something that's too mirrored in the game. When moving through Lincoln, you actually only ever encounter the infected, because Bill's got such a tight leash on everything. After being shot, Bill tells Frank to call Joel, as he's someone like him who's able to take care of weaker people. This is of course why he was entrusted with Ellie, and we very much have this dynamic of a strong survivor protecting a weaker, less equipped one. Bill survives though, and in a twist of fate, Frank is left in the wheelchair. We then jump to 2023, and finally catch up with the present. Both are in their winter years now, and we can see that Frank has spent a lot of time painting. This is important too, as it shows that the better side of humanity like art and agriculture haven't died out in the desperation. He's trying to paint Bill, but due to losing his motor functions, he now can't do it. However, we do close out with a painting of him, which pretty much sums up the love of his life. They have these really subtle moments like Bill giving a wink to Frank as he paints him, him watering the flowers for the last time, and at this point you could be forgiven for thinking we're not even in a zombie apocalypse show. Bill wakes up to find that Frank has decided this will be his last day, but rather than wallowing in it, they decide to make the most of it. The pair get married and have dinner together, and Frank wants to take his pills so that he can fade away into the night. We hear the song on the nature of daylight, and having just covered Shutter Island and Arrival for the channel, I think the creative team were inspired by those two films. Both use the piece, with I think probably the latter lending itself better to what's going on here. I don't want to get too spoilery on it, but the end of the movie is about embracing the beauty of life, no matter how heartbreaking it is, which is also reflected in this scene as well. The pair have what could be a very painful day ahead of them, but instead they're using it as a way to celebrate their life without dwelling on the sadness of death that we're all going to face one day. Yeah, I think that's a really solid point because the Last of Us world is one that often you think about. It, you're like, it's such a bleak world. It's so dark. And, you know, it, it's such an interesting subversion with a character like Bill, if you know the game, because Bill is one of the most hardened, ruthless people you encounter the furthest thing from welcoming, right? While that's captured in the show, you see this evolution. They still find, like, pr the purpose to live, the experience, the memories uh, that they are able to generate together over time. And that's part of the, the glory of watching an episode like this is even in the darkest of times, they manage to find light through human connection with one another. I find that to be such a rare thing to explore in an apocalypse story. Yeah. I mean, while that, that can often be there, but for that to be like a, a 
focus of a whole episode tell such a classic beautiful tale of two people falling in love creating a life together of protecting each other serving each other but also making each other laugh all this time it was so unexpected for this yeah. show and, yeah. and to also do that for bill but i thought it worked perfectly even as a fan yeah. of the game i thought it worked perfectly yeah, and also to add on to just personality traits from Bill, he's very paranoid in the game as well, as well as we saw earlier on in this episode. I think the thing I love the most to a lot of what you were just saying is the emotional depth we got in the character, yeah. in both characters, rather in the relationship, the way we got to see it. I just love the way how they, the the separation of time, like it was just done very well, like just getting to see their relationship blossom. And then again, in such a bleak post-apocalyptic world, which is obviously the worst of times, like something beautiful can spiral out of that. That as well and again it's probably going to cause interesting debate after this episode because it didn't follow the game specifically and obviously we didn't get you know the ellie and uh, bill uh, skirmishes which i'm a sucker for but i think this episode you know had a very beautiful theme and message that i deeply appreciated and we still got the version of the game so that's good with that but again this was so satisfying to watch that it doesn't bother me that we didn't get an exact replica of what happened in the game so but i'm very curious to see how the response is going to be yeah, there's all positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Bill then reveals that he's decided to go out with Frank rather than continue living. Romeo now, this Juliet. is a complete 180 on his original feelings when the outbreak first happened. Whereas originally he wanted to survive by himself, here we see that he's grown to the point he'd rather not live if it meant he lost Frank. Mm. At this point, we hear a song from the game that also happens at an emotional moment in it. We'll talk about this later on in the super spoiler section. See, that's the other thing is that I love is as a character, like Bill before the apocalypse was such a, a lonely person who dejected the very thought of connecting with people. Yeah. He has that line in the in the game uh, uh, in the show of like, I was never scared until I met you. I love the irony of how he didn't find a true connection until most people were wiped out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like it's there's something very ironic about that. I think that's a, that's a beautiful story. But it's very much used in the context to show that not everything is bleak. I think you kind of need this moment to breathe in a show like this as <laughs> The Last of Us, yeah, it can be pretty depressing. So it's nice to have this balance of like, look, there is still some good. Ellie and Joel arrive at Lincoln to find the flowers starting to die and the food on the table has started to mold. She plays some notes on the piano, echoing the earlier scene, and finds a letter which mirrors the one from the game. Here though, it's a lot more positive with it outlining their lives together. We learn they laid down and went to sleep and again I got some flashes of 28 days later. In that, Jim goes home to discover his parents have done something similar, but they showed it there, whereas... The letter warns them not to go into the bedroom. Now it's addressed directly to Joe, and Bill says that though he hated the world, there was one person worth saving. He's talking about Tess here, but now that position has of course shifted to Ellie, who he's gonna go on protecting. We get a focus on the sentence about keeping Tess safe, which is pretty devastating because Joel's of course failed to do this. Instead of confronting the grief though, he immediately leaves and takes his mind off it by crumpling up the letter. Just in the same way that this Bill part of the game ends, the we get a scene in which they discover the truck and lift up the front. Joel also checks the fridge, which has sulfuric acid in it. Joel asks to see her arm, and this could be teasing at something that we'll discuss. So, no spoilers, because I'll get I'll get tons of comments, but super, super spoiler section. Now in the basement, we discover why there was 80s music playing on the radio at the end of episode 1. Bill had it set up so that if he didn't reset the countdown, then it was just going to play 80s constantly on a loop. This would of course signal that they were in danger, and it would get Tess and Joel to come out to where they were. Now it is possible that Bill knew this would happen anyway, which is why he of course addressed the letter to Joel. Now I do have a quick through time, new time, new time, new time. So Joel and Tess, uh, they'd been searching desperately for a car battery so that they could get to Tommy. Originally in the game, they sold guns to Robert, but the whole thing in the show revolved around getting a battery for a truck. Bill of course has one, and I think that he might have had the 80s music on loop so that they were going to come out looking for him. He left down the keys for the truck because he possibly knew that they needed one and thus this is very much his last bill and testament to gift them with the ride that they've been looking for. Anyway that's in a few time and we can see Ellie few time. Sorry have to let that few time. Few time. Few time. Sorry ha have to let it play out. Few time. Few time. Right as I was saying. Few time. It's going to be stuck in my head for a while. Right, as I was saying, the pair get some clothes and Ellie slips into the red t-shirt that she wore throughout the game. She also finds the handgun, and I believe it's the same model as the one she carries in the source material. 
Jill gifts it to her in there, but here she takes it behind his back, which might cause some issues later on. Jill comes out, finally wearing the green checkered shirt that he dons throughout the majority of this story, and you might have noticed Frank wearing this earlier in the episode. They get in the car together, and originally in the game, you had a much tenser scene in which you had to jumpstart it. Joel and Bill had to push it as the infected swore them, level. whilst Ellie yep. sat in the ride attempting to pop the clutch. Love the little touch of her not knowing to wear a seatbelt, and together they head out as she discovers the cool. tape in the glove box. No points for guessing what the song is, and we watch them ride out to Linda Ronstan's Long Long Time. We close out to an open window with a picture of Bill hanging up, which takes us into our super, super spoiler section. I was thinking this. Now, for this bit, I will be talking about elements that appear in both games. They aren't ending, well, one of them's an ending runer, but there are some moments in Easter eggs in the episode that will probably spoil things down the line. Awesome. If you're out at this point, I'd really love you guys if you hit the thumbs up on the way out, and make sure you subscribe to not miss our breakdowns in episode 4. Thanks. Right, what a f***ing s***. Now play the games. What the, what the bloody hell is wrong with you? Anyway, the open window has a lot of big moments in the game. It's the menu screen for the first one, and in part two, it's also the last shot as Ellie yep. walks away. That summed up the end of her story, and here, it's very much summing up the ending of Bill and Frank's. The Mortal Kombat 2 cabinet is pretty important as well, and I think it's something that's going to return in the series later on. It ties in massively yep, with the Riley story, yep. and in the DLC left behind, you played on the turning cabinet alongside Riley. My guess is that they'll do something similar on the Riley flashback and have them imagining what it's like to play Mortal Kombat 2, wasting money, getting their asses kicked by Scorpion. <laughs> now on the road, Ellie Get also discusses here. Monkey and how she bets that they spread the cordyceps. Monkeys actually show up in the game, how we end yep. up encountering them when we enter the university. Turns out the Fireflies were experimenting on them to find a cure due to them being so close to us on a DNA level. Might not have been a connection to that, but with monkeys potentially appearing down the line, I thought I'd bring that line up. There better be some this fucking monkeys. Acid could also be something as well, with that being administered in the series. In part two, when Ellie and Dina bunker down, she ends up showing her her arm. We discover that Ellie did a chemical burn on the bite using sulfuric acid, and this was then covered up with a tattoo once it healed. Ellie got sick of constantly having to hide her arm, so she carried this out once it became clear that the cure thing wasn't going to be. Oh, burn. yeah. Part two. We get what could be a nod to the spaceship scene in that. A thousand percent. Ellie talks about the car being like a spaceship. And in part two, Joel takes Ellie to a museum for her birthday. I love that Here part they climb into so an much. Apollo vessel, and then Ellie imagines what it's like traveling into space. Anyway, that wraps up the breakdown, and I think this episode kind of transcended the apocalypse to tell a love story. This is something that's been at the heart of the show, and in the official podcast for episode one, they said that the show was very much going to be discussing the positives and negatives of love. Yeah, it's a more wholesome outlook, but in the case of Joel and Ellie, we see how dangerous it is. Joel begins to love Ellie like she's his own daughter, and because of this, he dooms humanity by killing the Fireflies in order to save her life. So we have this idea that love can be a good thing, but also that it has its negatives as well, especially if someone stands in the way of it. I think this was important to explore with Bill and Frank, and it'll probably massively influence the future episodes, even if it's not obvious. Now, yeah. it's a big deviation from the game, so whether people prefer that or not is going to be something I think they're going to be going back and forth over. I, I think the stuff in the game works better as a level, because you travel through the graveyard, the yeah, school, yeah. and of then course. you fight a bloater in it. Kind of ramps up to a boss, which I think works in a game, and the show kind of really needed to do something different. Agreed. So they focused on character development, gave us a bit of a breather so it wasn't all doom and gloom, and they also managed to make one of the side characters way more fleshed out. I enjoyed it, and so far I think we've had three really, really strong episodes. I know there's kind of back and forth at the moment, but let me know your thoughts below. And again, thank you for rocking with me. Of course. Thank you, and thank you for getting the theory time, theory time, theory time stuck in my head. Yeah. <laughs> but no, it was a great video. I mean, so much of this sh show, yeah, of course, exploring the, po the positives and negatives of love is, is an everlasting theme in The Last of Us. Um, of it's so prevalent throughout both of the games. We can have our muddied interpretations of what we do for love and in the name of love, what consequences that can lead down. So, yeah, I think that's a, a great thing to constantly be exploring and to make it such a, a something that's really on the surface for audiences to really attain to. Obviously, the monkey reference I made earlier, that was obviously the one I was making. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, no, I agree with everything you said. And I also agree with Paul. I, I think, again, w 
I love that they this episode took a little more of a slow burn, just getting more fleshed out with these characters, especially a character like Bill, who's not fleshed out in the game in any other way other than we know a few character traits and just that he's really hard and, sure. uh, and that kind of thing. But like to get me this emotionally vested in, in such a side character that I just thought was... You know, just a hard ass, badass type of character in the a side character in the video game. It, I just I thought it was a really smart move for for the TV show. And again, the levels play out better in the game, but this plays out better in the TV show. So I thought it was again a, a very wise and smart decision to do. At the end of the day, you actually technically get more bill <laughs> oh, in the show more. Yeah, way more. than you do in the game. It's yeah. just you're you're playing levels with Bill, so yeah. it feels like you might have more Bill, but that's not the case. You're, you get way more story on Bill here than you do at all in the game. So yeah, well, I the think characters, it's yeah, way more fleshed out. I mean, you get obviously action sequences with Bill in the video game, whereas right. here you get a lot more character development with I think one action sequence. And I gotta say too, really quick before we let this go, we probably talked about it in our reaction video. I absolutely loved that scene that they had with the four of them at the table. Right. And just little character traits where Pill's got the, the like his hand on the trigger while he's eating. Yeah. Like I'm like that is just so Bill. Like just the paranoia and the, so Bill, so Bill. Um, but yeah, uh, no, that was it was a great episode. And also too, the makeup that they did with Anna Torv uh, with Tess, like just making her look so much younger. And then also how they aged out Bill and Frank it was just all around just a great episode. Phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal work. Heavy spoilers. You're becoming a super wealthy rich man with these videos, and I'm happy to see it happen to one of the best guys I know out there. Guys, subscribe to Heavy Spoilers if you haven't done so already. And hey, let's end this with shouting out some pa Hey, thanks for joining me here, John. Oh, no problem. Rachel Reardon, you got a great song out there. Danger, Jeffrey Robinson, danger. She didn't, he never heard that before. Real Najoss, I saved myself. Barca fan 101, my my favorite kind of lounge chair. Roberto Angla, man, you damn. Angelo 10 Downing Street. <laughs> what ho? Taiko Waititi. Ian DeCastaker, Neil Simon. Shanghai Noon. <laughs> <laughs> Shanghai Jacob Neptune. Kayla the Con. No. Oh. Kang the Conqueror. <laughs> Kelly King. Mitchell Reed Richards. No more boobs. All and Ling. James Howlett Burden. I want to get a bureau with Kira. Eric Kahn's 39. Doesn't like to do 69s. The football number because YouTube's weird. Coosey Coosey dancing the Batusi. Nick Triple X. Uh, Ice Cube. One long, too gory for YouTube. Uh. Gail Weathers, Craig Ferguson. Mohammed is the most commonly used name on earth, Al Sharani. Jaron Big Wanner. Stiff Cliff Rodriguez. Aaron Michael Myers. Master Teeth. John the Goat with a big boat full of hoes. Tron Magic Infinity, Jared Leto, let's do it. It's a disaster when you're around Lorenzo Baxter, but really it's not. It, it makes life go faster. Nothing is plain when you're chilling with differently sane. Marco Tun still loves to kill. <laughs> oh, look out. Use the force, Lauren American Horse. Simply Faded is uh, not the name of a Chili Pepper song. That is so much faded. Joanna Banna Bobana St. Luigi. Rogue Willie. Slow Jam 94. Justin Cartman. Oh. Pour me a glass of rose, Bay Tay. You got it. Rachel Albre Alden Aaron Reich. Semi Colin. Philip Screwdriver Jr. Jen and the Holograms Smith. Melanie committing a felony while drinking a Hennessy in public. <laughs> Le LeBlanc a donk. <laughs> All righty, guys. Thank you so much for being part of our Patreon page and showing that support. It means the world to have Love you here. You it's uh, one of the best ways to help keep this channel afloat. So thank you for being here again. Hope to see at least 99% of you in February if one of you goes. That's fine. But no more than one. But there can only be one. If you leave, you got to find a replacement. Yes. M's the rules. All right.
right, I'll watch this video conclude.